Welcome to the study of God's Word with pastor and author Ed Taylor, recorded live at Calvary Church in Aurora, Colorado. To learn more about the many resources available through Abounding Grace Media or to tune into our live stream services, visit us online at calvaryco.church or download our free Calvary Church app. Now here's Pastor Ed to take us into our study. Amen. Open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 7, a new chapter I've entitled, God Makes Himself Known. You want God to reveal himself to you. And the way that God reveals himself to you is through his word. You remember when we were studying the book of Hebrews, it said that God is previous times had spoken through the prophets, but in these last days, he's spoken to us through his son. We go back in time to this true story of Moses and Aaron and the children of Israel and this man known as Pharaoh. Pharaoh's a title, title of a leader of Egypt and leader of the known world. Pharaoh has met his match with this man named Moses, but his match wasn't Moses. His match was the God of Moses, the power of God represented through these two reluctant but obedient men. Moses and his obedience, even his reluctant obedience, is being used by God to communicate God's great power and sovereignty to another human being. And yet he's being rejected, which certainly you've experienced in your own life when you're talking to people about the things of God, when you're sharing your testimony, when you come down from the mountaintop, if you will, having this amazing experience only to be met with resistance. This is a picture very much of how you and I face a culture that hates God, a culture that's turned their back on God. Their hearts are hardened. And the more and more we step into into their lives, the more and more we want to share, it seems the harder they get. But I found this scripture, jot it down, in Luke chapter 12 and verse 11, Jesus is teaching his disciples and he says, when they bring you to the synagogues and the magistrates and the authorities, do not worry about how or what you should answer or what you should say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say in that very hour. This is challenging for some of you who like to plan ahead and be ready. There are some things God's gonna wait to give you until the very hour, in the moment. And here we are in the hours of Moses and Aaron and Pharaoh now. Pick up in verse one, notice. So the Lord said to Moses, see, I have made you as God to Pharaoh and Aaron your brother shall be your prophet. And you shall speak all that I command you. And Aaron, your brother, shall speak to Pharaoh that he must send the children of Israel out of his land. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. But Pharaoh will not heed you so that I may lay my hand on Egypt and bring my armies and my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great judgments." And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. If you haven't marked that already, you're reading ahead. Is, since we go through the Bible, you can read ahead. If you read ahead, mark verse 5. The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, which tells us a little bit before we jump into the text. And this encounter was more than for Pharaoh and those in his court. It was for the whole nation. It was for the world to see the power of God. And I think even in our own lives, we have to think, we have to really understand something that there is an immediate work of God that's happening right now with you and someone else or a situation. But what God is doing has far greater implications. Your life, my life, has so much more meaning than the immediate. And so here, the Egyptians are gonna know. By the time this is over, God says, uh, they're gonna know when I stretch out my hand, verse five, on Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them. Then Moses and Aaron did so just as the Lord commanded them, so they did. Moses was 80 years old and Aaron 83 years old when they spoke to Pharaoh. Pharaoh's about to find out how futile it is to fight against God. He's about to find out. It's gonna be a hard, long road for him to find this out, but he will find out. He will see very clearly just how weak he is Understand this. This is a man that 
everyone's afraid of. A man that has all the consolidated power that a man could have in the world. All of the wealth, all of the possessions, everything that anyone would ever ascribe to and more is about to find out just what an empty life he lives apart from God. Here is a man literally in charge of the known world, but he's not really in charge at all. And whether you're Pharaoh or you're a mom at home or a dad out at work or a mom at work and a dad at home, doesn't matter, a kid at school, you're gonna learn this lesson soon enough. You can learn it the easy way or the hard way, but you're gonna learn this, that you are nothing apart from the Lord. You're nothing. You have no resources, no power, no ability, and even what you may have that is measured in the world standards was given to you by God, is entrusted to you by God. Even the hard work you might lean on, you go, no, pastor, you don't understand, I'm a self-made woman, I'm a self-made man. You don't know how many nights I stayed up late studying and cramming for that test and how many degrees I've earned and all that I've done, to which I say, man, that's a lot of hard work, but who gave you the strength to stay up at night? Who gave you the mind to think? Who gave you, you may be on the spectrum of being a little bit smarter than the rest of us. Where do you think that came from? It came from the Lord, your creator. He's been gracious and good to you. Pharaoh here, he has everything, but he has nothing at the same time. Just like Jesus would tell us later, who would give up? Who would gain everything, but then lose their own soul? Who would give up their soul for the world? You know who? A lot of people. They have everything, but they really have nothing. Saul of Tarsus reminds me of that young man by the name of Saul who was ready to take on the world and destroy the, the church. You know, he was studious and smart. He was spiritually strong, he even had this veneer of religi- religiosity, if you want to use that word. His zeal took him out to take out Christianity. He was so confident and so strong personality that he was going to take out Christianity himself. God would even tell him as Jesus met him on the road to Damascus, he would even look at Saul and go, why are you kicking against the goads? Pharaoh, thousands of years earlier, is kicking against the goads. The goads, those strong sticks that were used to prod the animal. And when the animal didn't want to go forward, you could kick against it, kick against it. I don't want to. I don't want to go your way. God says, why are you doing that? It's going to come to an end. If it doesn't come to an end where you bow the knee to Jesus here, the Bible says there's coming a day where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. You'll either do it willingly or unwillingly. Let me put it down. Let me be a little more clear, just a little more simple. Have you learned this lesson yet? Have you come to this conclusion that it's foolish to fight against God? You won't win. Even if you think you're winning, you're not. You're losing and you're self-deceived on top of that. You can't win and prevail against God. Sin is so deceptive and subtle, filled with lies. Let me give you one. Jot it down, Ecclesiastes chapter eight. This is very common. Ecclesiastes chapter eight and verse 11. Listen, it says, because the sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, Therefore, the hearts of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. And really, if we translate that, paraphrase that, just because you haven't been caught yet, you think you can get away with it over and over and over again. And I just want to emphasize this word in the paraphrase. Did you hear it? I said it very quickly. But let me just emphasize it one more time. Just because you haven't been caught yet, yet, that day is coming. Even if not before us, everything is naked and open before the eyes of the Lord who knows all things and searches all things. I guess it's not even fair to really say you haven't been caught yet because you've been caught right in the act. We get away with nothing. Secret, I think it was Spurgeon that said, secret sin down here is open scandal in heaven. (laughs) There is no secret sin. Don't ever mistake, church, the long suffering of God as the approval of sin. Never mistake the long suffering of God as the approval of sinful behavior. Yes, God is patient, and his patience, the Bible says, is for your salvation, for my deliverance, but no way an endorsement of your sin. Notice in verse two, Aaron and Moses are sent with a very direct command. You shall speak all that I 
command you. Why? Well, Pharaoh couldn't relate to an unseen God. He was used to worshiping idols of stone and worshiping animals and the things of the earth. So God chooses to send Moses as a tangible messenger to Pharaoh. He commissions him and his brother, notice. Uh, it says, Aaron and your brother shall speak to Pharaoh. I'm sending you. Aaron's going to be a prophet, but you're both going to speak to him. I'm going to use both of you. Pharaoh, through them, would understand the one true living God through the impression that Moses and Aaron would make. Through the representation, they would be the ones representing God, which reminds us today this is the mandate upon us. In a very real way, we represent the God who's unseen and the God who's resisted and rejected. And through our lives, whether we like it or not, it's a heavy, in some cases, it's kind of a heavy deal. Like, I don't want, like, no, I'm not perfect. I stumble all the time. I don't want people looking at me like that, but, but they are. And so it's best just to embrace what God's doing in your life. I'd say, okay, if you're going to look to me as an example, then here's my response. I want to be a good example. I don't want to shy away what God's called me to do. I want to grow in grace. I want to learn from my mistakes. I don't want to run away. I don't want to be reluctant. I don't want to make excuses. You want to look to me as a, then I want to, I want to get as far as Paul did. He said, follow me, imitate me as what? I imitate Christ. And if you change your language a little bit, your, your life follows your language, you know? As you begin to speak the truth and say, yes, God has made me an example, then I'll live up to what God has called me to do. Whether you like it or not, you and I are representatives of God. Uh, hold your place here. We haven't turned much, but turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and mark this passage in your scriptures here in your own Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And when you get there, go to verse 20. Such a glorious enlistment, like instead of something to run away from, it's like, no, Lord, I embrace it. I want to be an honest. I want, to, I want you to see my successes. I want you to see my failures. But in anything, I want you to see the God of my life. And what I do in success and failure, I go to the Lord who loves me. Notice, therefore, verse 20, this is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us we beg you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Your life and my life leaves an impression, an indentation in people's lives. And what a privilege it is to represent the living God to a dying world. And notice again, back in Exodus, there was a specific message to deliver. It wasn't Moses' message. And it wasn't Aaron's message. It wasn't to be edited. It wasn't to be changed along the way. It was God's message to be delivered God's way. Moses wasn't to add to it or take away from it. There would be certain things he would have to say, certain things he would have to share even if he was uncomfortable with them. Today we may say something along the same lines that the gospel message cannot be altered. The gospel, the good news, that's what the word gospel, if you, how many of you heard the word gospel? Say amen. amen. How many of you know it means good news? Amen. It means good news. That if you're new to the Bible, when you hear the word gospel, it, can, it refers to the good news that your sins can be forgiven. And it has a specific definition in that the gospel reflects the problem that we have in separation from God by sin. It reflects the penalty of sin, eternal damnation from God. Uh, if we live a life in rebellion to God and we die that way, it, it reflects, the gospel does, the gift of God is eternal life, that by faith your sins can be forgiven through the blood that was shed for you on the cross of Calvary. And as we learned recently, in the resurrection, Jesus Christ coming to life three days later, he proved everything that he ever said. It's absolute, bona fide, trustworthy, eyewitness proof that Jesus Christ is alive today the gospel. We can't add to it. We can't make the gospel something else. We can't muddy the waters of the gospel. We can't pretend that the gospel is not as hard as it sounds. And we can't pretend that the gospel is softer than it is. We need to keep the word of God and not mess around with it. There is no power when you mess with the gospel. I mean, if 
Moses and Aaron had a little meeting before they got to Pharaoh and go, I don't know about this. What do you think? And they're brothers and they're like, I don't know. I'm not feeling it right now. I'm not feeling it. How about if we change it a little bit? And they took that changed message to Pharaoh. There is no power in man's word. There is no power. We learn in Romans chapter one that the gospel itself is the power of God unto salvation for those who believe, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. The power is in the word. The power is God using his word to transform. We can't be messing around with it. We can't add or subtract to it. We can't allow the culture to somehow define for us what the gospel is or what it isn't anymore. We all need to be saved and forgiven of our sins or we are toast. That's a paraphrase of the gospel there. (laughs) We are done. Our kids need to hear it. Our grandparents need to hear it. Our neighbors need to hear it. What we need to be careful of is in the delivery of it, but in the delivery of it, we need to be 100% faithful to the word of God. There is no room for you to mess with the word of God or me. And even for someone in my position, the Bible says that because I have taken the Bible to hand and I've responded to the call to teach it, that I now face a stricter judgment, a heavier judgment. And you know that? That's concerning to me. I don't know what it means exactly, except that there's a greater responsibility. And I know the mistakes I make, and I know the weakness of my humanity, but at times I recognize that in the weakness of humanity, it's almost you know the flip side of the coin where God's looking at Moses and he's all reluctant. It's almost like God's saying, that's what I can use. I don't need anybody that's all prideful and ready to take the world for me like you used to be, Moses. This reluctance, it's like clay I can mold and shape. Uh, So, you know, don't go so far to make excuses and and don't refuse to obey me. But this this humility or this place where you're not quite sure and you need to be dependent upon me, I can hear God say, that's exactly where I'd like you. You come to me and depend upon me and I'll show myself strong on your behalf. Why? Because it's for my glory, God says. There's a nation that will see all that I'm going to do. And God's instruction to us This is the answer you've been praying. For some of you, this is the answer to your prayer. This is God's word to you. You must learn to give them his word. You must learn how to proclaim his truth. I'm not advocating, you know, being weird, right? Because you're like, man, I don't want to be weird. You know, it's like if if anybody accuses you of being weird, it's not the Bible. It's you. You're weird. It's like you leave here all excited. It's okay, I'm going to go to work tomorrow and I'm going to stand up on my desk and I'm just going to yell to everybody, you bunch of sinners, I knew it. You're going to hell. My pastor said to declare the word and they escort you out in security and then you come and, oh, I can't believe it. They're persecuting me. No, you're just weird. Don't do that. Don't do that. You need to learn how to live in this world but not be of this world. Like some of you are at a job place right now. You go, they don't want me to talk about the Bible. They don't want me to mention the name of God. They don't, okay, well, follow the rules as far as you can until they tell you to sin. You can learn how to share the Bible with people without it being on your desk. You can learn that. For some of you, you need the Bible off your desk so that that doesn't become a crutch so that the word of God will come out of you. Now, if you can have your Bible on the desk, put it on the desk. I, I, I'm not advocating that you hide your faith. But for some of you, you're like, man, I need a new job because they won't let me bring the Bible. They let everybody else bring their dumb books and I can't bring my Bible. All right. You said you wanted to work there. Follow the rules. What's your problem? Tie, take God's word, hide it in your heart, and give out the word all day when you're talking to people. You don't have to quote scripture. You can just begin to share with them what Jesus taught you. It's an attractive thing. And then after work, when you have your Bible in your car, you can say, oh, wait, wait, wait. I want to share something with you. You know, I wanted you to, sh- I wanted you to see, that I could see how you responded to what I share with you. And I just want you to know that that wasn't from me. It's right here in the Bible. And then you just pull it out and you start to read to him. You say, see, this is the power of God's word. But you know what, what happens? You get all beat out of shape and you're going to get all upset. I'm going to quit. I'm going to quit. They won't let me bring my Bible. What are you talking about? The Bible is in you. It's already there. Just walk in the spirit. Let him use you and give him your word. That, I, like I said, that's probably an answer for someone because it's much easier, isn't it? 
just to flip out and be upset and you know, write letters to HR or whatever. And then while you're writing letters to HR, the person in the cubicle next to you needs your attention. They don't need you all upset because you're representing the Lord. Can you imagine Pharaoh coming, I mean, Moses coming to Pharaoh and going, you know, I don't like God. Why am I giving you a word anyway? I told him I didn't want to do this. See, Aaron, I told him I didn't want to do this. I mean, Pharaoh's just going to laugh. Somehow, there was something that the, the presence, the anointing, perhaps even the Shekinah glory of God was on Moses and Aaron that would capture the known ruler of the world to give him, give them his attention. There was something in them. And as we look at the culture around us and we see it so dark, you know, that even in the darkest of culture, you know, the darker things get, even the less light it requires to make a difference. And if you can just tap into that and get the word of God in you, why do you read your, why do you read your devos in the morning? Why? Because you want to get the word of God in you. You want it to shape you, inform you. Why are you reading a chapter of Proverbs every day? So that you might hear the wisdom of God. Why would you flip through the Psalms? Because you want to deposit the worship of God inside of you. Why would you go to the Gospels? If that's all you're reading for the next years, you would go to follow Jesus so that you learn how to walk with him and you learn the ways of Jesus. If that's all you did for a year, at the end of the year, you will be a different woman and a different man. Your heart will be melted before him. You match that with obedience. What, what we need to learn is how to walk into things tactfully and obediently. They need the word of God. They don't need our opinions. You've heard that from the pulpit here many, many times. It's very important to me that you grasp this. Nobody cares about your opinions. Nobody. You shouldn't even care about your opinions. And to that, everybody leaves. Everybody's leaving right now. They're done with me. No, don't check out. Nobody cares about your opinions. You're the only one that really cares so much about your opinions. You're the only one. No, no, Ed, you don't understand. I found seven other people on TikTok. They care too. (laughs) They're all bots anyways, you know. It's like. And you know, quite frankly, most people don't care about the word of God either. They don't really care about what God's word is or, you know, what the Bible has to say. But here's the difference between God's word and your opinions. You ready? (laughs) You ready? Your opinions are your opinions. And God's word is power. It's living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It cuts to the heart of the matter in people's lives. So people don't care about your opinions, although you might get a few claps and likes and whatever. People don't care about the word of God, but God uses the word, his word to cut right to the heart. Very rarely does he use your opinions that way, unless, of course, you're sharing a biblical opinion. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, people are touched by that. But don't ever forget, there is no power in our opinions, but there's much power in the word of God. And so Pharaoh and Mo, um, Aaron and Moses, they come, and, and they had to come with this confidence because look, he's telling them what's going to happen, verse 3. I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart, which if we're standing there before God, don't you think we'd say, well, what am I going for then? Like if he's not going to listen to me, and he's not going to care about me, and he's just going to harden his heart, then why should I go? And, and he says in verse 4, in case Moses was really questioning it, and Pharaoh's not going to listen to you. It's like, what, what am I going for? But the answer in verse five is, the Egyptians will know. That's why you're going. Just trust me. Or what's the phrase they use today? Like, just trust the process. Just trust the process. It may not be happening the way you want it right now. It may not be ending the way, but you're not at the end yet. So just trust the process. What is that? How does that translate to us? Just trust the word. Don't be looking for immediate gratification, immediate results. Just trust the word. Because God may do, be doing something more behind the scenes that has nothing to do with the moment. Just faithful, obedient, trust God with the process. He's, got, he's working something out. Remember, when he says, I will harden Pharaoh's heart, there's two words in the Hebrew that we're dealing with here when it comes to harden. One means to be hard, difficult, and show stubbornness. This is what Pharaoh will do. 
The other one is to stiffen or to make rigid. That's what God will do. God will come alongside Pharaoh's hardened heart and give him what he wants. So this is a common question. Well, it doesn't make sense. Why is God hardening Pharaoh's heart? But, but it's like the best illustration I can think of is like for you parents, you understand this with your kids. You understand this. You, you uh, have a piece of candy in your hand and, or the, your kid gets a piece of candy and, and you come and you grab it and you go, no, no, you can't have that. You can't have that right now. And they go, what are you talking about? This is the end of the world. I want that piece of candy. I got to have that candy. No, no, no. Kick and scream. And you're like, trust me. Trust me. You, you can't have it right now. And why would you say? Well, what they don't know is in the back room, you got a basket full of candy. You're ready to bless them. You're ready. You're ready to give them so much more, but you don't want to tell them yet. You're just testing them with this little piece in their hand. That's it. Just, just give it to me. I'm dad. I'm mom. I don't want to throw my weight around or anything. Just I'm telling you what to do. Give it to me. But in your back of your mind, you're ready to bless. You're ready to overwhelmingly take care of them. And they scream and kick and scream. No, no, no. And what do you do? You decide to do, okay, if you want the piece of candy, have it. Yay, ha, 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 gotcha, gotcha, dad, ha, ha, ha. Open it up, enjoy it. It lasts five minutes. And you let some time pass and you say, son, I, I need to talk to you. You know, what you did, it's just not what we're teaching you here. Obedience, however you disciple your kids and, I just want you to know I was ready to bless you. What? Yes, I was ready to bless you. I just asked you, told you to give me the candy. Why didn't you trust me? I just want, just give, him, give me when I ask you. I'm like, I want, I'm your dad, I'm your mom, I love you. I want to take care of you. I want you to trust me, but you wanted the candy. So let's walk back to the back room. Go ahead and open the closet door. Yay! And then you say, no. You can't have it. You got your reward. I gave you what you wanted. No, dad, I didn't want that. I want, no, that no, was pretty clear. Mom, come in here, roll the tape. <laughs> she takes off the phone. It's like, it's pretty clear. You said you wanted it. No, no, I didn't mean it. I don't mean it. I'll get back. I'll go buy another one. They start crying. All the water works. And you're like, no, I gave you what you want. Remember in the Psalms, the Bible talks about God giving them what they desired, but then sent leanness into their souls. It's that lesson of trusting in the Lord. So this hardening of Pharaoh's heart, don't misunderstand that God is not giving them a, ch his, a chance. There are 10 plagues coming. God has been very gracious to Pharaoh. But it's like God saying, Pharaoh, if that's what you want, then that's what I'll give you. If you set your heart on a course, God will strengthen you. So today, the good news is if you choose to follow God, then your sails are up and you can take off. And God will give you the strength and the joy. He will give you and empower you if you want to follow him. If you want to harden your heart, if you choose to go against God, then your life will be very difficult. Your life will be very difficult. Jot this down. Maybe memorize it. I memorize it in the old King James. Uh, in the new King James, it says in Proverbs 13, 15, good understanding gains favor, but the way of the unfaithful is hard. But the old King James is the way of the transgressor is hard. And that's how it got burned in my mind. This is the process God has chosen to display his power. We don't always understand his ways, uh, but we know that God has an end purpose in mind. So verse six, Verse six is great. We're making great progress today, but these are very important principles. Then Moses and Aaron did so. I hope that marks your life. Just as the Lord commanded them, so they did. And then I love this. Don't, let's not miss verse seven before we move on. Moses is 80 years old and Aaron is 83 years old when they spoke to Pharaoh. They're in the prime of their lives, 80 years old. 83. Just the opposite of what our society says. So those of you that are Silver-haired, what does the Bible say? The silver-haired silver head is a crown of glory, and in it is found the way of righteousness. It was, this was God's timing to use Moses. We learned this from Pastor Bob Claycamp when he joined our team. He had a word from the Lord that God gave him uh, as he progresses in age. And the word the Lord gave him was that his latter years would be more fruitful than his earlier years. And if you get a chance to talk to Pastor Bob, 
and ask him if that's come to pass, I'm certain that he would say yes, that God is still working, that in your older age, in the, those of you that are up in years, God is not done with you yet. Don't listen to the culture. Don't listen to even the church at times. You know, and sometimes you look at the church, you go, oh, they got all this new music and all these. Yes, 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 we do. We do have new music uh, that is not 80 years old. You're right. Because there's a whole new culture we're reaching. So it's nothing, nothing for you to be upset about. It's not a decision against anyone that's old or young and any of the things, the technology, the different things that weren't the way you were growing up. But those of you that are older, I want you to remember this. You had your day. You had your day. The music was fresh when you were young. Uh, there was another generation uh, that was saying the same thing about you. And what we need to remember is we just need to learn how to die to ourselves and allow the Holy Spirit to do what he wants to do among us. And the older generations, those of us that are older, we're saved. We're saved. And the younger generations, the people we're going, the unsaved, the culture's different. It's a different, can anybody notice the culture's different than 50 years ago? Yes, no? So the word of God never changes, but the delivery of it does, and reaching the culture does. The gospel never changes, but the methodology has to change. And so it's not when I say you had your day, I'm not minimizing that. I'm just reminding you when the music that, and it, you know, even in this sense, well, you know, I wish we could play the old time hymns. Sometimes we do. But you do know there are new time hymns. And if the Lord doesn't come back in 30 years, people are going to be saying that. <laughs> I was listening to Pastor Ian. He, he took us into a little bit of a song um, that's 20 something years old tonight that I remember when it was introduced to the school. <laughs> I remember when I was hunting around looking for the cassette tape of that particular band, uh, when, uh, whether it was Hillsong or it was um, Matt Redman or whoever introduced that song, um, it was 20 years ago. And some of you go, which was that? I didn't know what it was. I know, because it was 20 years ago. But here's the point. These men are a model for us that are growing old in the Lord. And this is what I want each year that my life passes. I want to be used more when I was 30, 40, 50, pushing 60 now, 80, if God gives that to me, than I was when I was first saved at 23. I want to continue on. There is no such thing as retirement for the Christian. Now, you might retire from work and from some other things, but as far as serving the Lord, no, no retirement. Get out. Like there was a lot of people that were commenting on the soup tonight and I said, exactly, this is what I want to do. I want to open a taco stand. I want to sell tacos till noon and then rest the rest of the day and maybe we can add a little soup as a side. <laughs> and Marie always reminds me, first of all, Ed, I will never do that. But second of all, there's no retirement. That's not what God's called me to do. Maybe God's called you to do that, but that's not what God called me to do. God's called me to reach the culture a different way than you have. And if you uh, are called for a taco stand, then make the best tacos ever. So that the reputation of what you do for the Lord is the best of the best. And I'll visit your truck and give you a five out of five for sure. <laughs> if you're called to teach the Bible, then you study to show yourself approved, a workman not leaning not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, and keep perfecting the craft of delivery. You do what God has called you to do. There is no retirement. No matter your age, you're 80 years old right now. You go, man, I just got saved. And I, I think I'm, I, I wish, I wish, and we respect that. But you know what? There's no looking back. No matter what age you are, there's only looking forward. And let the Lord use you in greater ways. All right, you guys with me? Because that's what Moses did. That's what Aaron's at. These are old dudes being used greatly by the Lord. Verse eight now. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, when Pharaoh speaks to you saying, show a miracle for yourselves, then you shall say to Aaron, take your rod and cast it before Pharaoh and let it become a serpent. And Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh and they did so just as the Lord commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and his servants and before his servants and it became a serpent. But Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers. So the magicians of Egypt they also did in like manner with their enchantments. And every man threw down his rod and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed up all their rods and Pharaoh's heart grew hard and he did not heed them as the Lord had said. So these are the miracles that God would use to prove that they were sent by him. 
They would validate the spoken word. And up to this point, Moses and Aaron have only delivered ultimatums. But now God's going to, now Pharaoh's going to see. He's going to experience it. The power will be demonstrated. So they cast down the rods and there are snakes there. And, and you're like, what happened with these magicians, verse 11, and sorcerers, these miracles? How, how did, what, what did they do? Well, the magicians did in like manner, but it doesn't say they did the same thing. The magicians did in like manner. They did not do the same thing. And for your consideration, there are four possibilities when it comes to these magicians. What happened here? Uh, How did their rods become snakes? Number one, it's possible that they received supernatural power uh, from the devil himself with God's permission. Uh, Probably not. Number two, God gave them temporary power directly Probably not. The rods were, and here's a funny one I found. I didn't make these up. This is a commentary somewhere. The rods were rigid snakes already. So they were kind of sleeping like, so dumb. Uh, And then, you know, maybe they froze them or something. And when they cast them down to the ground, they woke up. Uh, Yeah, probably not. I think that they received some kind of deceptive power uh, from the devil. Uh, that this was just completely false and fakery. I don't want you to forget in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8, that part of the end times deception has to do with the ability of God, or excuse me, of the devil to fake and lie. And it says here, the coming of the lawless one, 2 Thessalonians 2, 9, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with power signs and lying wonders. Somewhere in the supernatural realm and the devil's creative order, he's able to lie and make it look real. He's able to even demonstrate things as we'll see in a moment. It's interesting that the magicians are neither, uh, it says here, uh, the men that they call wise are not wise. The sorcerers and the magicians of Egypt, they're dealing in black magic and they're dealing in the demonic realm, which is why we always, you know, any pastor that's faithful to the word of God will plead with you to stay away from that stuff. Don't even mess around with it. Don't have it in your house. Don't, don't let your kids get involved with it. Like, stay away from it. It's deceptive and lying. And, it, and it, even the magicians and everything, it doesn't help Pharaoh very much. Because what is the devil's plan for Pharaoh? To kill him. So he'll be lost forever. What's the devil's plan for all of Egypt? To kill them. So that they might be completely separated from God forever. They'll die in their sins and their idolatry. So this magicians, these sorcerers, they're not demonstrating the power of God at all. They're the antithesis. Now, verse 12, it says, every man threw down his rod, they became serpents, but Aaron's rod uh, swallowed up theirs, and now Pharaoh's heart's growing cold. As we study through the 10 plagues coming up here, you'll see how they get harder and more severe, the plagues do. At times it looks like Pharaoh might be softening only to turn harder. Eventually he'll be backed into a corner and he'll have no choice but to give in and let the people go. And as we move forward, know, just for your, to plan ahead for our studies with the plagues, know that the plagues are twofold. Number one, the plagues are designed to bring Pharaoh to his knees and get his attention But secondly, the plagues are being used to show God's power over the false Egyptian gods, little g. That's what the people needed. Pharaoh needed it, but the people needed it as well. They will serve as concrete evidence. Jehovah is the one true God. And the fakery and falsehood, as we'll see, I mean, Let me give you a hint. We're going to head out because we're out of time here. Um, But when the next plague comes with the rest of the chapter, we're not going to finish it. I don't want to plow through it. I want to take my time uh, with it. So we'll catch up another time. But as as the water is turned to blood, you will notice that the, the sorcerers came and just made it worse. Now, doesn't it make sense that if truly they were representative of the power that's greater than God, that the magicians would have reversed the plague, not made it worse. And that's just how the devil is. He's illogical. 
He, he's not thinking straight because his goal is different than God's. So anyone that's following the devil in their deception, you can know that something is not from the Lord because it's set for you. Like you're looking at it, you go, why would you, why would you make things worse? That's not from the Lord. It doesn't have to necessarily be from the pit of hell, but you can say, that's just not from the Lord. I don't, why would you do that? Well, you know, such a, well, wait, wait a minute. That doesn't even sound like the Lord. Why? Like there's blood and nastiness in the Nile and you're just going to make it worse. Why would you do that? Well, you know, the Lord told me, no, oh, man, the Lord didn't tell you that at all. Well, you just see what Moses and Aaron did right now. No, no. God told Moses and Aaron to watch this. God didn't tell you to make it worse. And so as you read ahead, I want you to notice that. And again, read ahead all the way through chapter eight. Um, we'll see what we can cover next time. But for homework, I want you to read Ezekiel chapter 20 to gain a little bit of insight on the children of Israel's heart. Ezekiel chapter 20. Just to see a little bit what's going on in their hearts as we see it as well, maybe a mirror to ourselves, but God uses these things in our lives to bring us to our knees, to get our attention, and to reveal his power over the false gods that we worship, right? Because we're standing here going, sitting here in a sanctuary, going, watching online, listening on the radio somewhere. We're like, oh, those idolaters, those idolaters. What we should be saying is God save us from our idolatry, from our false worship. Save us from the false worship of money or career or whatever, you know, who knows? Who knows what comes in the way of true worship of God, what replaces our sufficiency that's found in him. And so it's so, so encouraging. I wish we had more time for the rest of the chapter, but we'll get to it next time. So Father, I thank you for your word and, and knowing that you have a word for us and uh, being able to remind us of your faithfulness and, you know, reluctance and um, maybe we're like the kid with the candy in the hand. One little piece of candy and we just won't let go. It's all we want in the moment. That's it. Nobody could take it away. We're not going to trust you with anything. We're going to hold on, hold on, hold on. And we can almost hear you say, well, go ahead then. Take, keep it. And in our heart of hearts, we'll go, yes, I was right. I was right. But then in the closet, you had such great blessing waiting for us. And we settled for this immediate little thing. And so forgive us, God. Forgive us for not seeing the big picture and bring us back like today in the verse. Give us eyes to see the spiritual reality. Let us see what's happening in the spiritual realm. Let us see, God, the, the place that you have us. And for, for some, maybe the, the little excursion about work is, is your word. What has happened to us, Lord? That we would forget our mandate as ambassadors. That we would no longer be tactful. That our opinions would be more important than your word in our lives, God. Please deliver us and help us to walk in the newness of life. With your power, your strength, your demonstration, signs and wonders. Lord, healings that you would use us to speak a word in due season. That when we would pray, we would pray with great faith. Lord, that we would find ourselves not afraid, but walking in boldness, open to a freshness of your Holy Spirit, open to be used in ways that would surprise us, where we wouldn't be stuck, and that we would make room for the next generation. And we'll bring our generation along. We're not forgotten, but we will make room. We'll make room for the generations. We sing that song, we'll make room for you. And we'll just all come along. The young and the old, who knows what the babies right now in the nursery, what music they're gonna wanna listen to. What songs they're gonna write. I wonder what illustrations some of those babies when they teach the Bible are gonna be using. And we just wanna make room, Lord. We wanna learn from our elders and we wanna be elders to teach the young. And we just wanna be a place where we're not hindering you, God. So bless your church tonight. Let's rise up and allow the Holy Spirit, Lord, we, that's what our desire, we want to rise up, allowing your spirit to use us in ways that it far exceed anything that we can think or ask. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand together. And um, yeah, it's a great section of Bible.
a great section of the Bible. And you guys that are older, I don't want you to be offended. That wasn't intended to offend you. It's intended to stir you. Because if you don't, you're going to be stuck. You're going to be stuck in a time, and you're going to watch the time pass you by. Because we need your wisdom. But we need your wisdom to be delivered in a way that's agape love. Not, we don't do this and this is not, like, we don't need that. What we need is your love and your experience and your flexibility. Because the young has a lot to learn from you. And guess what? You have a lot to learn from the youngsters. You know, what, you know one of the things that I love about kids is they just go for it. They just, some kids, they don't even think about it. That's why they're getting hurt all the time and they're jumping this and doing that and they just go for it. Another thing I love about kids is they just speak their heart and mind. They don't really have a much of a filter, but they don't really need much of a filter. Jesus used kids as an example. He brought a kid and draw, sat him on his lap and said, such is the kingdom of God. He's not saying that those of us that are older are not the kingdom of God. He was telling a bunch of adults, don't forget this simplicity and this simple faith and this innocence and this, this is the kingdom. And so the Lord has a lot for the old. Who wants to admit they're old today? I am. I'm a lot older than I ever was. And who wants to admit they're young? He's like, oh, we're all young. No, I was like, look, look. Be open to a fresh work of the Spirit. And don't look down on anyone. Help us along the way. Let's serve and make room and make space and not be too hot, haughty or, or uh, arrogant with each other. Just let the Lord do his work. Amen? We pray that you've been encouraged by this Bible study delivered live from the sanctuary of Calvary Church. For prayer, call us at 877-30-GRACE. That's 877-304-7223. To listen to this message in its entirety or to join us for our live stream services, visit us online at calvaryco.church or download our free Calvary Church app. Be blessed as you worship Jesus this week.